Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Brandon Brooks, Hector Bones, Dan Crafton, and our new patron, Priscilla Lucia. Welcome, Priscilla. On this episode of DTNS, our final favorites from CES, including Shannon Morse's favorite laptop announcements. Plus, Rob Dunwood looks at why Microsoft just passed Apple as the most valuable tech company. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, January 11th, 2024 in Las Vegas, Nevada. One more time, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And from the DTNS CES booth, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Che. Did you almost forget who you were? I did. (laughs) Because we did, definitely, (laughs) over here. Uh, We're feeling that way. Uh, we've We've got less of an avalanche of news, but still a lot of stuff to go through. We're We're kind of picking up some of the pieces that maybe got got missed earlier in the week because it's such a flood at CES. So I'm kind of excited actually, to show some good stuff. I like the the last days of CES. They feel more fun. Yeah. Because yeah. you can kind of go like, okay, let's take a breath and give it a second <laughs> look. Yeah. Maybe I want to talk about that bird thing or <laughs> those weird glasses. Tom, don't ruin it. Eh, no, it's Oops, just a little, little tease. Just a little tease. All right. Before we tease too much, let's start with the quick hits. Shortly after its X account was hacked to say that it had approved a Bitcoin exchange traded fund, or ETF, the Securities and Exchange Commission announced that it was, in fact, this time for real, approving 11 of the first Bitcoin ETFs, which are used for lots of collections of investments from gold to K-pop stock. Tom, you're probably excited about that one. The idea is a company invests in the resource and you hold a share of the value of that investment so you don't have to hold the actual item yourself, like gold. The SEC resisted approving Bitcoin as an appropriate resource for an ETF, but after a court loss, it had to change its tune. It's seen as a moment of legitimacy for Bitcoin. Google confirmed a round of layoffs affecting hundreds of employees across multiple units, including hardware teams responsible for Pixel, Nest, and Fitbit, its voice assistant team, and the majority of employees at its Augment Reality team. Fitbit co-founders James Park and Eric Friedman are also among those departing the company. Google said hundreds of folks in its central engineering team are being impacted as well. The company is also discontinuing 17 Google Assistant features it calls underutilized. Starting January 26, features like playing audiobooks with your voice, managing a stopwatch or or smart speaker or smart display, and using your voice to send an email will prompt a notification that the feature is winding down with most set to stop entirely February 26. Google does have some positive news, though. It's no longer charging switching fees for clients that are leaving Google Cloud in order to entice more folks to come over from Azure and AWS to try them out. Google wrote, Google Cloud customers who wish to stop using Google Cloud and migrate their data to another cloud provider and or on-premises can take advantage of free network data transfer to migrate their data out of Google Cloud. The company also formally endorsed right to repair and will testify in favor of a strong right to repair bill in Oregon. In a white paper, Google's Steve Nickel described access to the same documentation, parts, and tools that original equipment manufacturer or OEM repair channels have. He also wrote that Google should ban parts pairing. That's a tactic that restricts what kinds of parts can be used in devices from iPhones to John Deere tractors. Hertz said it will sell about a third of its electric vehicles, mostly Teslas, and replace them with gas-powered cars. The number one rental car company in the U.S. says the demand for EV rentals was lower than expected, and that, combined with falling resale value and higher repair costs, brought about the decision. That may be surprising, given that EVs generally have lower repair costs because of the lack of a combustion engine. But Hertz said that Uber drivers, which used about half of its EV fleet through a partnership program, drove the cars hard and repair costs were higher than expected. Amazon launched Badge Pay, which uses its Just Walk Out technology to let a company's employees pay for things with their badge without having to go to a cashier. The first client is St. Joseph's Candler at its Candler Hospital campus in Savannah, Georgia. So instead of scanning a credit card if you want to buy a Coca-Cola or something, as an employee, you scan your badge on the way into the hospital, you get what you need, and then you walk out. The system tracks what you take and applies it to the payroll deduction system that's already in place. And hospital visitors, they just use a credit card as usual. Mm, good. I mean, you could use your badge to pay otherwise. That makes sense. Kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's always way too much to cover at CES. But as the announcements begin to subside, we thought we should take a moment 
uh, to let you know some of the things that caught our eye that might otherwise slide under the radar. Sarah, your first thing is for the birds. It is. For the bird enthusiast in your life, or that might be you, Swarovski showed off its Optic AX Vizio binoculars, which use AI to identify over 9,000 species of birds and even other wildlife that you might not be able to otherwise identify yourself. Maybe you're far away. When you've got a bird in focus, you press a button, an integrated operating and object recognition system, as it's described, plus onboard neural processing, tells you what you're looking at. The binoculars have a 1,000-yard field of view, built-in GPS, so if you take a photo or something, you know where you were later. Also, takes 13 megapixel photos. Um, also can do 1080p video. Uh, transfers to a companion app if you want to keep that stuff. It is $4,799, Ooh, but wow. if this sounds up your alley or, I don't know, a real nice gift for someone else, coming yeah. in February. That's less than one of those small cars that we <laughs> talked about yesterday. It's more than a Vision Pro. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is Swarovski after yeah. all. So, yeah. you know, this, that's true. Point. This is probably a little bit more like, ooh, very You're nice binoculars rather than, you know, the rugged binoculars that you might be using today. For the fashionable birder in there your you life. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Nick from Australia pointed this one out in our Discord. Thank you for this, Nick. Uh, LKTT's short circuit, uh, I'm sorry, LKT, why, how'd that L get in there? LTT's short circuit channel uh, covered VO's interesting use for a transparent display. We've been saying those transparent displays are pretty, but do they have a practical use? Here is one. The company VO took an LG display, one of the transparent displays, because remember, LG display just makes the panels. LG TVs sell TVs with the LG display panels in them. Uh, so VO took an LG display transparent OLED and put a camera behind it. So you can look right at the monitor during video calls and also be looking right at the camera. Uh, you could try this yourself with a transparent display, but the camera would show a lot of distortion from the operation of the monitor, right? So you can't just put any camera behind it. Uh, there has to be some software that filters out that distortion and creates a clear image. So that's VO's trick, is they built the camera in, uh, and they built it so that it's going to filter out that distortion. The camera and monitor combo is expected to be available in 30 and 50-inch sizes for pre-order in Q4 2023. This kind of reminds me of a teleprompter. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, yeah, what I yeah, was yeah. thinking. That's I was exactly like, what I was thinking, yeah. I it, it, I but instead of, of glass, yeah. instead of glass that's mirroring a display underneath it, it's actually the display up there. So that's, yeah. that's kind of cool. You can have the display right over it. In fact, I wonder if that that's another use for it. It seems obvious, I think right? it would be, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Health tech pioneer Barracoda has unveiled the world's first AI-powered smart mirror, BeMind, designed for mental wellness. Powered by generative AI for conversation and coaching experiences, as well as natural language processing for sentiment analysis. BeMind identifies mood and helps manage stress by providing light therapy sessions and personalized auto-generated mindfulness exercises. Um, so this sounds pretty cool. I, my, first my first question as always with anything that is AI and facial recognition type stuff is who did they test this on? You know, how many <laughs> they diverse data sets, who do they yeah. train it on? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because they're, they're just, there's just differences in how people look and express themselves based off of ethnicity. So mm -hmm. I'm really curious as to how many different ethnicities that they test this on. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and to that point, uh, what range of moods, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what, what range of mood disorders were used, you know, is it, how accurate is it th at that part of it too? A uh, lot, lot of questions there. It's, <laughs> it's an interesting, it's an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, it's like if I'm looking into the mirror and I'm having a real bad day and I'm crying, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, you would want it to be able to pick up on that, but I could also just be smiling through the pain. We yeah. all do a little yeah. bit of that, too. So, you know, how smart is smart, I guess. Or and maybe it gets I, to know you better over time. What if I have a facial condition? What if I had a stroke? True. You know, what, yeah. what if I have a, a mental condition? You know, that, sure. that, yeah. that it needs, you know, is it aware of all of that sort of thing? It's, it yeah. is nice looking, though, just as like a bathroom mirror, oh, yeah. you know, wherever you want to put it. China-based company Daruchi, which makes a line of sleep products ranging from smart mattresses to bedding to curtain tracks, showed off what it says is the first smart anti-snoring pillow at CES this week, which it claims can reduce snoring by up to 89%. There was an internal clinical test uh, that it went through to get to that number, but that sounds pretty good, right? The pillow monitors for slight movement and can indicate snoring, uh, just based on kind of vibration stuff. Then it adjusts the loft and moves the position of you as the sleeper's head. 
The idea, reduce the risk of sleep apnea, along with snoring, because sometimes they go hand in hand. It also pairs with an app and a remote, so you can get yourself into a comfortable position before you fall asleep. It's coming to the U.S. sometime this year, no specific date yet, but it will also cost around $972, so Oof. yeah, better work. Let's just I mean, say I kind of want one. <laughs> Not for I, me, but for I my per- husband. Yeah. I, I prefer a non-snoring bedfellow myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an expensive gift. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, follow up on my previous one where I said it was coming out in 2023. There's no time travel involved. I meant 2023. Oh, <laughs> man. I thought you had slipped in something pretty cool. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Reverb Mike for pointing that out in chat. All right, <laughs> next thing. Essilor Luxottica, one of the many companies showing off smart eyeglasses at CES. These kinds of things are all over the place in all kinds of different configurations, doing mm-hmm. different kinds of things. The nuance frames that Luxottica showed off demonstrate uh, the ability to increase your ability to hear when you're in a crowded room, a loud room, uh, by using multiple mics that will amplify sound coming from the direction the frames are pointing at and therefore should correspond to what you're looking at. That way, you know, a lot of people with mild hearing loss will just have to kind of turn their head so they're you know talking to my good ear. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this would obviate the need for that. Sound is delivered through speakers that are in the frames to help you hear better, and you can control the volume in a companion app with a remote or by touching the frames. I feel like I'm going to want to touch the frames, but it's interesting that they have these options. Uh, keep in mind, these are not hearing aids. If, if you need a hearing aid, you're, you're going to have to go another uh, route. These are not going to go through the approvals needed to be called hearing aids. They're just a helper if you have slight hearing loss. I like that. I, I'm glad that we're seeing so much like accessibility this year. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's pretty cool. Tech. It almost reminds me of those commercials you would see late at night where they're, they're not hearing aids, but they're just things mm-hmm. that help you hear yeah. better. This uh-huh. is kind of what that reminded me of. Mm-hmm. Well, I think a lot of people who you know, aren't, uh, you know, whether they've had an actual diagnosis or not, like aren't under the impression that they have extreme hearing loss, but Mm -hmm. maybe are suffering a little bit too needlessly in that in-between phase. You know, this is, this is a product that might work for them. And Joe Hunter is like, I I just want it for crowded bars. I mean, it might be helpful (laughs) for that too. Yep. Yep. Airdrop Gaming has announced that it is now shipping its audio radar, a gaming accessory that transforms video game sounds into visual signals for deaf and hard of hearing gamers. Audio radar visualizes key sounds such as footsteps and alerts and works with Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. I applaud them for this because I actually have a coworker whose, uh, whose son is deaf. And the things that young man would go through to actually be able to play games, like he, he literally would have like subwoofers sitting under his chair oh, wow. and turn them up like extremely loud. So it's, it's loud for everybody else in the house. But for him, uh-huh. he could actually feel explosions and things mm. like that when they were coming that would give him the cues that he couldn't actually hear. So this is actually really cool tech for folks like that. This is kind of the uh, equivalent of visual description on streaming. Oh, if, yeah. If you've ever heard of that, where, yeah. like, you can have it read the action, like uh, a man walks down the hall uh, for, for people who can't see the action. Um, this isn't reading it, though. This is showing the audio. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. Well, super high-end custom-built TV maker C-Seed showed off the 137-inch N1 TV at CES, which folds down into a rectangle bench of sorts, and that stores the TV away when it's not in use. Now, I did say foldable. When you are using it, though, the N1 screen can rotate 180 degrees and uses a proprietary system that the company calls adaptive gap calibration to measure the distance between the unfolded edges with sensors that detect offsets and calibrate the brightness of adjacent LEDs. Uh, CNET said we could not see where it folded when the TV was actually in use. Now, (laughs) there are a few versions of this. The 137-inch indoor N1 goes for $200,000, but that includes installation and setup. An outdoor version for $240,000 if you want to go bigger, there's a 165-inch version for $300,000. And I know, I know what you're thinking. Money's tight these days. So we have a 103-inch version for just $110,000. The economy. Wow. The economy such, brand. Such yeah. a bargain. Such a bargain. I mean, it is cool. It is just, you know, I always say this. It's like I don't have a room big enough for this. 
why do rich people want to hide their TVs? Have you ever noticed this? There's always a TV concept at CES, like LG's rollable, right? Maybe Where it's it for cleaning. Goes down, and they're always crazy expensive. Yeah. Well, you maybe figure if you've got the money and the space, maybe that TV room is a ballroom also. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they want to hide their TVs. Yeah, I've never really understood that. that. Yeah. yeah, maybe it is. Um, yeah, or maybe it's just to impress their other rich friends. <laughs> Yeah, like, look at my TV. It folds down to a bench. Go sit on it now. See? Yeah, sit on it. Yeah. There you go. So Microsoft has surpassed Apple's market cap to once again become the world's most valuable company. For the, for the past several months, Microsoft's stock has rallied due in large part to the company's investment and announcements in artificial intelligence. Apple, on the other hand, has been trending downward, suffering four consecutive quarter-over-quarter -quarter stock drops for the first time in over two decades. And Apple stock was recently downgraded, wiping out $162 billion in market cap in 2024 alone. So the problem for Apple seems to be that its fortune is tied to hardware sales, which, especially post-pandemic, simply have not rebounded to the levels the analysts were hoping they would. The iPhone 15 has also seen weaker sales in China, which is the primary reason that Apple stock was downgraded. And even though the global premium smartphone market has rebounded, Apple's market share has dipped 4%. So, all right, Tom, uh, Apple's reliance on Mac and iPhone sales, it's a pr pretty, bi pretty big part of the company. Consumers are buying fewer of both. Is this a longer-term issue for Apple? We're, we're going to have an interesting Apple year this year. Um, yeah, it could be. It could be. But it could have been in 2016 when Google passed Apple. It could have been in 2018 when Microsoft most recently um, began passing Apple again, and they, they passed them in, in 2020 and 2021. So I look at this, and I think, you know what? I bet this has more to do with fluctuations and Microsoft's just getting a little closer. I think it says more about Microsoft than it does about Apple to me, which is Microsoft's killing it. Uh, Azure is remaining strong. AI is doing great uh, for Microsoft and, you know, getting Activision Blizzard, you know, with whatever you think about it as a consumer is, is a positive for Microsoft investors. So that boosts the price again, whereas Apple has been in a little bit of a fallow period, but they stay in those periods for only so long. And the Vision Pro is the first salvo out of the gate. Um, I'm not saying that the Vision Pro is going to save them, but you know we are moving to Apple. You know, starting to rev things back up again. The, the clock is ticking on that, though, right? Services have been what they are pivoting to, and services have been growing. But are they going to grow fast enough to overcome the iPhone thing? And then the China situation is another question mark. You don't know whether it's going to bounce back in China, which it looks like it might. Or are we going to have some un other unexpected thing that's going to cause a backlash against U.S. companies, and then Apple's going to suffer there too? I'm kind of glad to see that Microsoft has been rebounding so greatly and they've been doing such positive numbers because as as a Microsoft user myself, as a Windows user, it's it's really um, inspiring to see them be see them putting so much work into all the different things that they've been working on lately, especially like AI. Even even in the security and privacy sector for Microsoft and for Windows, they've been focusing on that a lot. And maybe people are starting to like trust them more. Maybe they're getting a better market cap. So it's really nice to see. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering if uh, Apple is you know as they're going through all these hardware issues, I guess if you can call them that. If they are going to start thinking about maybe we should pivot more into services, which it looks like they definitely did last year because services was great. And uh, you know just going forward, it's like you know you their software runs on their stuff. So if their stuff doesn't mm -hmm. sell, then that causes a problem for them. But I think as time goes on, what people are figuring out is that that MacBook Pro runs pretty well five or six years from now. That iPhone, you don't need to get one every year. You don't definitely, you don't need to get one every other year. Maybe you can go every three. So I just think maybe people's buying preferences are just mm -hmm. slowing down yeah. because their hardware is so good and now everything is moving back into the cloud. All this AI stuff, most of it's gonna run in the cloud and be sent to your screen. So you don't need to have the highest end device in order to utilize and capitalize on all this AI stuff that is going to be coming. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. You yeah. saw that with iPad, right? The iPad tanked. Everybody talked about the iPad being dead and it had a really good quarter last quarter because we finally got to the point where people needed to replace their iPad, but it right. took a while, right? Uh, so Apple's going to have that kind of stuff that's going to drag things down. That's, that, that's worth paying attention to, you're right. I just want to know how many Vision Pros are going to sell because I know that the price point is very high, but yeah, unless you sell a 
you know, crap ton of them, and I don't even think there are a crap ton of them in the world, then yeah, you're not you're got you're not going to get to the numbers that Apple has been enjoying in the past. Yes. Well, folks, if you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, uh, we are all over the Internet in all kinds of places. Of course, you can email us feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com, but we are on X, the formerly Twitter-known thing that's still at Twitter.com sometimes, depending on what URL you're looking at, at DTNS Show. Uh, we're on Mastodon, Twitter. Uh, we are DTNS Show, mstdn.social, Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks with an X, DTNS P-I-X, on Instagram and Threads. <laughs> Laptops may feel like a pretty boring form factor uh, at this point. Last CES, they stood out by adding new NVIDIA cards, but they don't have new NVIDIA cards this year. So they're messing with the form factor to try to stand out. Shannon got some hands-on time with a few laptops. They're trying to buck that boring label. They're bright. They have lit hinges, screens in their <laughs> lids. Uh, Shannon, what what have these laptops caught your eye? Yeah, you know, I kind of feel like laptop manufacturers are trying to focus on, like, what's going to wow people? What's going to make the, make it pop? And we saw some really, really interesting devices this year. So Asus Zephyrus G14, that was one of Asus's big name ones this year. It has a G-Sync OLED display, which is absolutely gorgeous in person. And it's 16 by 10. It's an OLED screen, of course. 2880 by 1800 at 120 hertz. So not only is it going to be great for content creation but it's also going to be a really good one for gamers if you want something that looks a little bit more sleek so one of the interesting things about this is it's the very first OLED laptop to support NVIDIA G-Sync, mm. which we've never seen before. So that's a really, really interesting component if you are a gamer and you want something that looks kind of streamlined and maybe you want to take it into a business yeah. meeting or something like that and you don't want a bunch of LEDs on it. This would be a laptop that you might be interested in. Uh, the G-Sync technology will match the display's fr refresh rate with the GPU's frame rate. So you're not gonna deal with any kind of like tearing or any issues like that. Asus also said that it worked with NVIDIA and Samsung display to increase the OLED's panel pixel emission rate to 480 hertz mm -hmm. for the G14, which is huge. Yeah, they had to work with NVIDIA to do the G-Sync thing, but they did the work, that's cool. Yeah, they did, and it, it looks so nice in person. It's one of my like wish list laptops for this year. So one of the really interesting ones, and I don't know if I would be the market for this, but it was so cool to see it in person, was the ZenBook Duo. So this one, we've seen a lot of like folding laptops and things like that with like two displays and you unfold it and you get to both of those displays. This one is interesting but it, because it is a dual screen laptop, but they revamped it for 2024. So now it has two equally sized 14 inch screens, which is great. So you don't have to deal with any kind of confusion there. Mm. And it has a lot of different configurations. So when I was checking it out, I got to see it in like a standard laptop mode where you still have the keyboard on the bottom. You can also have the, um, where the bottom screen is covered by a traditional keyboard and trackpad. So the fun thing is you can actually take that off. So you can have two screens arranged vertically or horizontally mm. with the keyboard and the trackpad on your desk. I was also able to see it with a digital keyboard, like a, a dis on display keyboard, instead of the one that you are using in front of you, the physical keyboard. So if you wanted to use like a digital keyboard instead on the bottom display, you could totally do that too. And then do you get a little more screen down there on the bottom that could do you other do. things? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, you do. And you can make them sync with each other so you can like browse the web on two displays at once. You can share the screen so that they kind of mirror each other if you're presenting somebody something to somebody on an, an, another side of the table from you. Like mm -hmm. if you need to sign a contract, for example, you can like double it so you they can read along. It, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Each screen is OLED and it's also the same resolution. So that 2880 by 1800 resolution with a maximum refresh rate of 120 hertz again. So that's very similar to the Zephyrus. This one we do have a price point for. It's fourteen ninety nine, and it will be available in the U.S. We don't have a date yet. Okay, that, that, that's we've seen the duo before, but it just keeps getting uh, a little more tweaked, a little yeah. more refined every time. Yeah. It's it's much more refined this year, and it was really fun to watch it being used and be able to use it in person myself because I noticed that sometimes you see these demos in the booths and it doesn't necessarily work very well, sure. but this one worked really, really nicely. So it felt really good to use, and I was like, oh, I can actually see a lot of people buying this if yeah, they it's, were. It's not it's not terribly expensive either. Yeah, no, it's not. I mean, this is this is very very affordable, and yeah. I'm just thinking like you, you could get one of these and and not have to buy an external monitor that you stick in your laptop bag exactly. and just it all comes together. So yeah, this is, I, I like this. 
so Acer also had some pretty cool laptops. If you still want to get something that's more gaming, they had a couple of different laptops that I really liked. There was the Predator Helios 18 gaming laptop. This one has an 18 inch display. It's ginormous with a 250 hertz mini LED. So this is going to be like your desktop replacement. Mm -hmm. It is still a little bit heavier, but it's it's so sleek and it's so pretty. Uh, this one did not have a bunch of LEDs on the back of it. So it would be something that you just leave on your desk if you don't really care about all the LEDs and everything. Uh, but if you wanted something fancy, they also had the Helios 16, which had that full RGB keyboard and had all those LEDs on the back of it that you could customize to your preferred settings. So this one is up to a Core i9-14900HX CPU and the RTX 4090 graphics 9.0, which is excellent. And it also has, and I love this, I got so excited about using this, swappable mechanical keyboards or, or switches for the WASD oh, keys. switches, not just the keys. Switches, keyboards. yeah, switches. Oh, cool. Isn't that cool? I know. I was like, oh, that's awesome because that's the ones that you're going to use the most if you're gaming. Yeah. So if you're, like, screwing them up, if you're getting them dirty, mm -hmm. if you just want to switch them out and use different kinds of switches you can totally do that i loved it yeah no, that's cool because it, it's one thing to be able to swap the cue to another style cue yeah. you know it's, a, it's another thing to be able that switch is starting to go or i just don't like the feel of it or whatever yeah, be able exactly. to customize it so the pricing is pretty good for both of these i think for a gaming uh pc especially an upgraded one with like 4090 graphics so the helios 18 will ship in march for about two thousand dollars starting and the helios 16 will ship later this month for $1,900. So a slight difference there. And yes, it is more expensive than like the ZenBook Duo. But again, these are like your upgraded gaming machines. And you've got LEDs on the hinge in the 16. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you need them. <laughs> hey, why not? They I love look it. cool. Yeah. So the last one I really wanted to check out in person was this. This is a concept, so it's not coming to market, but it was really interesting to see. Is the Lenovo 13X Gen 4, and it has this concept e-ink prism color cover. It was so fun to watch it in person, and my first reaction was, oh, is this like something that you, is it a display that you slap onto the back of your laptop? No, it is not. It's actually built into the laptop, so you have this really fun e-ink display back there. And you can customize all the animation, Etc. Etc. Uh, the ThinkBook 13X Gen 4 is a 13-inch notebook with a 74 watt-hour uh, battery, and it's powered by Intel's Meteor Lake processors, which is great. And this is also a, a smart personalization experience, which I thought was kind of cool. It's like a QA that Lenovo is allowing you to customize it for your own personality. Uh, the e-ink prism technology lets you also change the exterior color and the pattern of the laptop lid. So if you Say, say I wanted to do a Sailor Moon pattern. I could totally do that. And you would. And I would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think this would like be annoying to see all the time, or would you use it? After about 20 <laughs> minutes? Please, <laughs> please turn that off. I, I'm just trying to imagine somebody in a co-working space, and that thing is just going you know, just like just going mad. You don't notice <laughs> it because you're on the work side. Everybody yeah, else thing. is on the other side. It's, it they're seems going to see like it. a cool, like the Sailor Moon thing. It'd be like, it's cool. You kind of yeah. let people know what you're into. Not unlike, you know, dressing a certain way or whatever. But if it's moving and especially in a right. setting mm -hmm. where everybody's got laptops. Well, it, I'm the kind of person that has like stickers on the back of my laptop. Yeah. So I feel like this would just be something that yeah. I could customize and it, it would That's, be aesthetic. It, yeah. It's like animated stickers. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm wonder okay if this. a company would be willing to pay me to get one of these and put their advertising on the back. That's oh, thinking. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Sponsorship opportunities galore. Uh, well, cool. Thank you, Shannon, for, for uh, you know, sharing yeah. your insights with that. I, I think a lot of people are like, eh, laptops, just a bunch of spec upgrades. But these are, there's some interesting stuff out there. It's so interesting. And I, I just love watching what laptop brands are doing. And even when it's a really minute detail that they're changing, like they listen to users and they listen to our experience. And I always see them implement that in like the next year's model. So it's cool. Yeah. All right. Let's check the mailbag at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let's do it. Alan from Chile, Montreal, wrote in and said, Scott Johnson was asking on Wednesday's show about the build quality of the Rabbit R1 device, saying it resembled the Playdate console. The reason they're similar is because the Playdate and the Rabbit R1 are both designed in collaboration with Japanese tech brand Teenage Engineering. They're famous for their excellent audio products, digital music instruments, such as the beloved OP1 synth keyboard. Their stuff usually has very vivid, wacky, and fun UIs, too. Tony I did not Orlando. know that. 
and that's why he's that's why he uh that's why scott noticed that <laughs> So Tony wrote in regarding the Rabbit R1. I love the hardware design and the 360 camera reminds me of a Chinese phone a few years back that only had one camera, um, the main camera, and it rotates to take a selfie. I think the Rabbit AI is more digestible for early adopters than the humane AI pin that is designed to replace your mobile completely. I can always pop the SIM out of my phone and stick it in the Rabbit. I can't do that with the AI pin. I hope the Rabbit survives and continues to breed. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Rabbit R1 uh, got a lot of, you know, people scratching their heads and saying, D how does this work? But I like the idea of it. Yeah. Um, and quite a, quite a few did, in fact, because Alan and Tony are not the only people intrigued by this thing. Pre-orders have already opened for a second production run of the large action model handheld device. Goes for $200 after it quickly sold 10,000 units following its CES debut on Tuesday. Wow. Rabbit says, I know. Cool. Rabbit says, we were hoping to sell like 500. <laughs> so the first pre-orders are still on track to be shipping in March. The second run sometime between April and May. So, yeah, I mean, we've got we've got interest out of the gate. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. I did get an opportunity to speak with them this week, speak to a rabbit. And I'm very interested in reviewing one of them. So hopefully I can get one in and share it with y'all and give yeah, you kind yeah. of an experience. Oh, very cool. Else you do. Very yeah. cool. Uh, speaking Hope of, they have some left. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better get those pre-orders in. Uh, speaking of uh, sharing stuff with your audience, Shannon, what are you doing when you get back from CES, and where can people follow along? Um, first thing I'm going to do is take a bath, but you can find me at youtube.com slash Shannon Moore. I know, all our feet are so sore <laughs> from walking around the CES Convention Center. Uh, youtube.com slash Shannon Morris. I am posting a whole bunch of shorts this weekend, as well as a long-form video all about my favorite things from CES that are actually going to come out this year. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. A generative AI model has created a comedy special called George Carlin, I'm Glad I'm Dead, hosted by an impersonation of George Carlin, and his daughter hates it. Oh boy, we're going to cool. get the full story in just a few, but just a reminder, DTNS is live Monday through Friday, and you can catch it live at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back tomorrow with all the big home theater news from CES with Robert Robert Heron and Len Peralta drawn the top tech stories. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>